A reading from the second book of Kings. Name in the army commander, the king of Aram, was highly esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had brought victory to Aram. But valiant as he was, the man was a leper. Now the Arameans had, had captured in a raid on the land of Israel a little girl, became a servant of Naaman's wife. If only my master would present himself to the prophetess of Mary, she said to her mistress. He would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went and told his lord, just as the slave girl at the land of Israel had said. Go, said the king of Aram. I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman set out taking along ten silver talents, six thousand gold pieces, and ten festal garments. To the king of Israel he brought the letter which read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you that, he may, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When he read the letter, the king of Israel tore his garments and exclaimed, Am I a god with power over life and death, that this man should send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? Take note, you can see he's only looking for a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his garments, he sent word to the king. Why have you torn your garments? Let him come to me and find out that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. <coughs> the prophet sent him the message, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will heal and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry, saying, I thought that he would surely come out and stand there to invoke the Lord his God and would move his hand over the spot and thus cure the leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus, the Albana, and the Fafor better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? With this he turned about in anger and left. But his servants came up and reasoned with him. My father, they said, if the prophet had told you to do something extraordinary... Would you not have done it? All the more now, since he said to you, wash and be clean, should you go and do as he said. So Naaman went down and plunged into the Jordan seven times. At the word of the man of God, his flesh became again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He returned with his whole retinue to the man of God. On his arrival, he stood before him and said, Now I know there's a God in all the earth. There is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Verbum Domini. A thirst is my soul for the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? As the hind longs for running water, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? Send forth your light, your fidelity, it shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then will I go to the altar of God, the God of my gladness and joy. Then I will give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I hope in the Lord, I trust in his word. With him there is kindness and plenteous redemption. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dominos Rabiscum, Lexio Sancte Evangelii Segundum Lucum. Jesus said to the people in the synagogue in Nazareth, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is except in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many, many widows in Israel the day of Elijah when the sky was closed for three and a half years and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through their midst and went away. Verbum Domini. So the wisdom of a servant, 
right? Actually, the wisdom of a slave girl and then servants, right? Just uh, outshining the wisdom of the king of Israel, outshining the wisdom of, of Naaman, right? Uh, the slave girl and the servant. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, what does it take to be wise? What does it take to be prudent? Humility. It's humility. I don't care who that person is. If they are arrogant, if they are full of themselves, they will lack wisdom. Now, they may be able to, to talk a good tune. And bamboozle a lot of people. We see narcissists in the pro-life movement. We see narcissists in the conservative movement. In the Catholic Church. Who sway a lot of people. Because those people also lack humility. In our humility we see clearly my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is humility that gives us clarity. It's poverty poor in spirit, pure of heart, that gives us prudence and wisdom. And a prone to be truly obedient. And this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I think is the essence of what we see going on in the church today. The division in the church is a lacking of humility. There, there, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Is there a pridefulness in the Pope? I think that we're all prideful at some point in time. We're all guilty of pride at some point in time. Pride is, pride is the root of all sin. So if the Pope would say, you know, well, sure, I'm a sinner. And I remember early on, he said, pray for me, pray for me. He's called himself a sinner. This is humility. But he's had moments of pride. He admits it, right? All of us have moments of pride. There is a difference, though, between having moments of pride, moments of sinfulness, moments where we get angry, where we get frustrated, where we get impatient, where we fall prey to our human weaknesses, and being riddled with pride, filled with pride, filled with arrogance. A false humility. This is where we lose any sense of clarity, any sense of prudence, right? This is, this is really where we become lost, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is why I say, that is why I say, that if you come across someone who has nothing good to say about anything, nothing good to say about certain people, Right, But we have people who can find no good in the Pope. Find nothing good to say about the Pope. Will ignore anything that could be attributable as good and holy to the Pope. And the Pope has done many, many things that I am absolutely in awe of. Him calling out the nations of the world to condemn and outlaw surrogacy. His recent uh, talk on uh, love and marriage. His recent calling out the dangers of gender ideology. That many, many people who do not want to see any good in the Pope cannot acknowledge any good in the Pope. Will not acknowledge these things. We need to be aware of those people. Beware of those people. Be leery of those people, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And then let, let us reflect on true humility. True humility. There's no one here that can say that, oh, I am humble, because saying that I am humble is indeed a sign that you're not humble, right? Right? Now, honestly, we can all say that we deal with prideful tendencies at any given time, 
and that we need to strive for the virtue of humility in all things, at all times. This is very, very difficult, my brothers and sisters in Christ. But let us remember, if we want to see things clearly, if we want to be prudent, if we want to be wise, we need to humble ourselves. Let us now ask our Father in heaven to shed his mercy on all of our needs.